So good morning and welcome to our Sunday uh, theology class um, in the series Sharp Faith. We said we are going to alternate uh, between uh, this year three series of lectures, the series on Sharp Faith, so on the basics of Christianity, series of, uh, on church, social justice and civil society, and then the series on lectures for the Bicentennial, um, everything is in the schedule which has been sent to you, the plan of lectures for the whole year. So welcome to the people who are following us online and to the people who are here today. So we, uh, we talked about the Trinity, then Christ, then the Holy Spirit. And particularly after talking ab about the Holy Spirit, it is normal, it is kind of uh, natural that we should go into what the Holy Spirit does or what is attributed to the Holy Spirit principally, which is grace. And uh, the uh, two following lectures or three uh, afterwards on, on the series of faith are going to be about faith, uh, hope, uh, faith, hope and charity. So uh, um, um, more concrete aspects of what um, uh, grace is. Today, we're going to talk about grace in uh, general. And it is a um, not an easy topic. It is not an easy topic because the problem is that grace, more than any other Christian doctrine, uh, there is a sense in which it has gone crazy. It has gone crazy. It has been um, a variety of reasons, which I hope to um, at least outline to you. It's a bit uh, lost its compass and has gone into uh, ideas and assertions which are um, sometimes hard to um, make sense of. So I start with two quotations from the uh, New Testament, which, you know, of course, the whole New Testament is talking about grace, but particularly these two. So John uh, 15, 5, I am the vine, Jesus says, is the whole uh, speech on the vine. Branches, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And nothing means nothing. Okay, so this has been one of the driving sentences concerning the thinking about grace, uh, that is about the way in which God acts in our lives. And then the second one, which is particular dear to St. Augustine, but has been repeated constantly uh, in, uh, in uh, theological treatises about this topic is, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So what do you have that you did not receive? So in relation to God, what do you have that you did not receive? Everything is a gift from God. Of course, being created, existing is a gift from God. Uh, being kept in existence is a gift from God, but more than that, believing, uh, doing good, persevering in faith is a gift from God. Now, number three, these two sentences enshrine what has become known as the doctrine of grace, namely that increase in faith. Faith, so the ability and the possibility to believe in God. So, I, I put these two words side by side, they are quite important. It's just, it, grace is not just about us being able to do something, but without grace, it would not even be possible to do it. So this, this applies to belief in God, love or caring for others or anything um, good we can do to others. So the ability or possibility to do it, loving God and loving our neighbors is a gift from grace, a gift from God, um, and left to ourselves, we are unable to believe in God and to do anything which really counts as good. Uh, so there have been streaks of uh, theology of grace, of, of ways in which uh, theologians have talked about um, people who uh, are not Christian, in which even what looks good in what they do is not really good, because uh, there is not the grace of God. This has been one of the tendencies of the way, ways in which theologians have talked about the necessity of grace. 
So this human inability to believe and do good is seen as a consequence of human sinful state, that which often is referred to as original sin. So because of original sin, we are unable to do any good, to believe in God, to care for each other, and only thanks to grace we can do this. Now, I'm going to give you a little uh, outline of the historical development of this doctrine, but I don't want to stay very long on this. Then I want to give you a little taste, a little flavor of how crazy the doctrine of grace had become. Uh, and then I want to give you, and that's what really I want to go to, a more positive and a more spiritual approach to it. So I hope to give you something that really makes this doctrine uh, um, make sense uh, for you and also uh, helps you in your spiritual life. So especially from the 5th century, um, some theologians started to worry <clears throat> about whether such a radical affirmation of dependence on God undermines human freedom. So if everything is, is grace, if everything is a gift from God, if we can't do any good unless God gives us this possibility, where is human freedom? Are we free to choose good? Are we free to believe in God? Okay. And, um, and this goes uh, side by side with a uh, ever greater, or rather with an opposition concerning whether or what are the consequences of what we call original sin. So has original sin really destroyed our ability to do good? Or is it, has it only impaired, uh, reduced our ability to do good? So uh, the Pelagian controversy, number five in your handout, uh, the church was forced to provide some clarity on it, which also led to the establishment of sharp antinomies, uh, sharp opposition, sharp contrasts that have plagued the theology of grace ever since. So nature versus grace. So nature is basically what we are without grace. So uh, what, as, I as I told you, without grace, we can only sin. There are some theologians who would say that, would, would have said that today, well, uh, even today. No, there are some pseudo theologians who will say that, that without grace, we can only sin. Everything we do, even if it looks good, is bad. So even if you are, if you're a non-believer and you do an act of, um, you care for someone, it looks as if it was good, but actually is sinful. It's just as sinful as you didn't do it, okay? So nature of, uh, versus grace, uh, grace versus freedom, what I told you um, earlier, justification versus, versus sanctification, faith uh, versus walk, walk, works, etc. Uh, walk, mm, I can't say the word, work works. <laughs> the outcome of the Pelagian controversy was a declaration from the Council of Orange. You might never ever heard of this council, but it is one of the most important councils of early Christianity in 529. And listen to this declaration, which is number five on your handout. Not only the beginning of faith, but the very desire to believe in God is a gift of grace and beyond the power of human nature. So even if you have the impression that when you came to believe in God, this was you uh, accepting, you wanting it, you desiring it, in reality, this was a grace from God. Because without me, you can do nothing, as Jesus says in John, and uh, the two quotations I gave you at the beginning, and what do you have that you did not receive? So everything is received from God. So even the initial faith is a gift from God. We would not even desire to believe in God without the grace of God, which means that left to ourselves, we do not even have the ability to want to believe. Now, number five, three, and this I think is the key Thing to understand about this quotation. Now, this is uh, this quotation here is like is not in the creed just because they didn't put it in the creed, but it is as normative as the creed for Christianity. Okay, this is really defines what Christian faith is. Like we say, I believe that Jesus is God. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the church. That the church is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We also believe that even the very desire to believe in God 
is a gift. This is part of the, the foundation of faith. But it is very important to, to understand that it is, this is not a psychological description of the way in which grace acts in relation to human freedom. Okay? This is not a treatise of psychology. It's not, it's, it doesn't explain how. It gives only a principle, and you will, I will explain to you in a little bit why this is so essential when we talk about grace. Now, the obvious dilemma originating from this statement is this, hmm? number six one. If belief in God is possible only and absolutely as a gift from God, why does God not give this gift to every human being? Okay, so faith says we can only believe as a gift from God. There's nothing we can do by ourselves that can lead us to faith. So why God does not give this gift to every human being, right? And if some people do not believe in God, is it because God has destined them to be condemned? And, you know, however crazy this might seem, this became a streak, a, a current of thoughts in the theology of the church and became known as the doctrine of predestination. Predestination. You must have heard it many times. Predestination is pre and destination. So we were destined to believe or not believe. We were destined to be saved or to be damned before we were even born. Okay? God, from all eternity, has decided which one of us is going to hell and which one of us is going to paradise, which is really charming. Now, this is the Protestant tradition and especially Calvin. So the origin of this uh, thought is especially, um, let's say, uh, the late theology of St. Augustine. Uh, but then uh, it was revived and uh, became mainstream, especially uh, after in, with the Protestant Reformation, but not so much with Luther, but with Calvin. Okay, Calvin really um, made uh, predestination somehow the heart of his theology, even if, if a lot of the interpreters of Calvin would uh, soften this, this kind of assertion, would say that, well, it is true and it isn't true, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, you know, uh, they, um, um, with Calvinism, it became a dominant uh, aspect of, uh, um, of Christian uh, thought and Christian way, uh, and it uh, basically determined a lot of the way in people behaved. Um, there are theories, as you know, especially um, economic theories that uh, explain the uh, success, economic success of uh, the, 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 the Anglo-Saxon countries, and especially America, as a consequence of the doctrine of predestination. Because for Calvinists, at one point in the... Uh, so P Calvinists became Puritans, and the Puritans became the evangelicals. We know today, by and large, I'm giving just a very large uh, genealogy, <clears throat> there's this idea that, uh, in a, how do you know whether you are saved or you are not saved, that you are predestined to be saved? Uh, it became basically the idea if you are successful in life. So if you, uh, if you are successful, uh, you know, financially, even financially. And according to, the, to Weber, this gave a, a, um, a, a bo boost to, um, to Calvinist. And, um, and this is why very often uh, Calvinism goes with uh, economic commercial success. It also uh, is attributable to the discipline extremely uh, if you are saved, it has to show in your life. So, and how does it show? By the absolute discipline of your behavior. So this is why Calvinist and Puritans tend to be extremely rigorous when it comes to uh, the application of Christian life, because that's where they know whether they are saved or they are not um, saved. <laughs> so that's the main difference, you see, between Lutherans and Calvinists. Calvinists and Lutherans have a tendency to think, how do I know that I am saved is because I feel uh, that I am a sinner and that I need God's grace. So the stress is on the feeling. I feel that I need to be saved. I feel that I am saved. Okay? Whereas 
Calvinists would say nothing you feel matters. Uh, uh, you are either saved or not saved. Uh, there is no way you can, you can really know it through your feelings. But there are signs that you might be saved. And these signs are usually, and this is a bit of a caricature, but there is some truth in it, are uh, um, on your external behavior, okay? uh, on whether or, no, on, or not you are very rigorous in your Christian life and whether you're successful uh, in your uh, business. So uh, with Calvin uh, number seven, God destines some people to be saved and others to be condemned. <clears throat> this decision belongs to God alone, and there is nothing that human beings can do about it. And this gave a rise to this acronym TULIP. You might have you heard about TULIP uh, before? This TULIP thing. Uh, oh, if you if you Google it, is you know the, the the web is full because you know the web the web when it comes to theology is literally um, kind of saturated with uh, all these Christian colleges, especially with evangelical kind of um, persuasion uh, that uh, uh, popularize these these theories. So these theories, I mean, however crazy they might seem, they are absolutely vital today. They determine the life, the faith, the belief of millions and millions, uh, hundreds of millions of people, okay? So this tulip thing, so total deprivation, uh, they're all, again, I mean, really wonderful. So total, dep total depravity, unconditional election. So tulip is the initial of each one of these five principles. So total, the, the unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. So total depravity means that because of sin, we are utterly, totally, uh, uh, human nature has been totally kind of uh, depraved. Uh, so without Christ, we can only sin. Without Christ, we can only do evil. Uh, without Christ, we are destined to hell. There is no way out. We're, without believing in Christ positively, okay? Unconditional election means that God chooses the elect according to the intentions of his will without any consideration of merit within the individual. Okay? It's not because some people said, oh, well, probably God destines us to be saved because he anticipates, he foresees whether we are going to do good in our life and uh, foresees that other people are going to do evil. This is why he destines them to, to hell or to heaven. Some people tried to save predestination in this way. Calvin says, no, it's not at all whether you, you know, in, in, in foreseeing what you're going to do in the future that God predestined. It's just his decision. It's completely arbitrary, completely arbitrary. There is this um, parent of philosophical kind of uh, what's called voluntarism that comes from nominalism that sees that God is God because he acts the way he acts without any rationality at all. It's just, you know, uh, God's will is absolutely arbitrary, unpredictable. Um, God is God. He can do whatever he wants. Then limited atonement, that's the other thing. God saved only some people and few people. Only few are saved. Okay, so bad news to most of humanity. Uh, and obviously, those who believe they are safe, they feel immensely privileged about this, they feel superior about the others, etc., etc. Then irresistible grace. So if grace has decided that you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved. So there is nothing you can do against it. Okay? And if God is destined that you are going to hell, you're going to hell. No way out. And then perseverance of the saints, again. If you're destined to be saved, you're going to persevere until you're dead. So nothing can, can put you out of track. So you see, this is, a, this is an understanding of the way grace um, kind of um, um, invests human existence, which is, you know, absolute. Uh, human freedom doesn't have any role at all in this. And why they do this? They do this because they want to make sure that grace really is a gift, okay? If we can do anything to correspond, to deserve, or to correspond to grace, or to cooperate with grace, for them, it is a way of undermining the nature of gift of grace, okay? So they are so keen to defend the gift that they 
uh, obliterate uh, humanity in a sense. Now, this is, if you want, the Protestant and especially the Calvinistic or Puritan tradition. On the other side, there is the Catholic uh, tradition, usually identified with Thomas um, Aquinas, who says that even though, so uh, Calvin says total depravity, uh, Thomas Aquinas says that even though um, number eight one, the original sin, original sin has impaired our ability to believe in God and do good, it has not corrupted human nature entirely. So human nature is, is more ill than corrupted, is more uh, kind of um, um, uh, flawed than entirely corrupted. And then he has this famous sentence, which, you know, I put it in Latin because this quote is absolutely um, uh, constantly uh, all the time. Gratia non tollit, non tollit natura, naturam sed perficit. Uh, grace does not supersede nature, but perfects it. So, whereas for Calvin, you know, uh, human nature can do anything, so grace does everything. Uh, for, for, the, for the Catholic tradition, Thomas Aquinas, grace, uh, nature itself is a grace. So the fact that we know we exist and we have a will and we have a desire, we have an intelligence, already is a grace, and God builds on it. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> it's a way of saying that you know there is there is some continuity between creation and salvation. Hmm? So with regards to atonement, uh, we saw that uh, the Calvinism says limited atonement; only some people are saved, whereas. Uh, the Catholic tradition, this is not so much Thomas Aquinas, but it's especially, um, let's say, the fathers of the church. Yeah, actually, the fathers of the church. And then it has been re-evaluated um, uh, uh, with the Second Vatican Council. Um, the instinct uh, number 8-2 of Catholic thought has usually been against attempts to impose limitations on it. And the basis is a sentence by 1 Timothy 2.4, God wants, wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. God wants all people to be saved. So scripture, 2 Timothy says very clearly, God wants everyone to be saved. God, Jesus died for everyone. He didn't die just for some people. Okay. Those who do not come to faith in God through the proclamation of the gospel can be saved all the same because God can act by inspiring the conscience of each person directly. This is a bit, you know, uh, in Roman Catholicism nowadays is a bit the dominant idea. So uh, not only the people who have not been reached by the gospel in other countries, but even around us, as we see, most people do not believe in God, okay? or do not come to church, or for them God, God doesn't, doesn't count, well, uh, what should we think? Should we think that these people are going to be damned, not going to be saved? Well, uh, even some who are Christian who have been baptized, okay? Well, the Catholic instinct is to believe that uh, um, God has his way of acting in the lives of every human person. So this does not diminish our uh, our desire and our duty to keep proclaiming the gospel, to keep telling the story, because um, there is a fullness of revelation and a fullness of, of uh, fulfillment and flourishing that comes only with uh, being uh, openly a Christian. And yet, at the same time, the Catholic instinct is that even those who do not believe in God uh, are not outside God's influence. So God can act in their lives. God can uh, save them, wants to save, actually wants to save them all the same. And he knows how he does it. Okay, And especially by inspiring the conscience of everyone, which enables uh, people with a Catholic instinct to see good even outside Christianity and recognize it and acknowledge it and celebrate. Okay, Because everything which is good, wherever it can be found, comes from God. Which means that according to Catholic, uh, the Catholic instinct, I'm talking about instinct because, you know, the way in which it is explained often is a bit, you know, um, um, more complex than that. But the Catholic instinct is that um, whereas uh, for 
uh, the, the, the Calvinistic uh, theology, some are predestined to be saved and others are predestined to be damned. In the Catholic thought, everyone is predestined to be saved. God wants to save everyone. And, you know, and there are uh, kind of currents of theology in the Orthodox tradition, the Eastern tradition, and in Catholicism that believe um, that uh, God saves everyone, finds a way of saving everyone, even if we don't know how, which, you know, it's problematic in its own way, but just to let you know that there is this other possibility in Catholic thought. So, then there is another thing which, um, and I'm sorry to have to bore you with this, uh, but there's another thing is that, you know, the way in which, uh, in, in terms of the technical aspect of grace, the, terms, the, the way in which uh, in the Catholic and the Protestant tradition, the interaction between freedom and grace has been understood. So in the Catholic tradition, number 10, grace is seen as a virtue, becomes a virtue, that is a habit. So um, grace is not just God, um, um, it's like, you know, when, uh, when you have a, um, an animal that doesn't want to obey, what you do, you keep... Um, um, uh, picking it, you know, uh, nudging it, nudging it, and you know, and some people see grace as a nudge. So uh, we can do good only because we are constantly nudged. Okay, otherwise we would not, we would, we wouldn't go, we would go our way. This is more the Calvinistic or the Protestant way, whereas the the Catholic way uh, has an understanding of grace as as becoming a, a, a habit, becoming something that you know. Uh, we do because it fashions, it shapes us, it shapes our will, it shapes our intelligent, intelligence, our desire in a certain way. And for this reason, we go there willingly. So we don't need to be nudged constantly. It becomes a virtue, it becomes a habit. And also there is this other idea that, you know, uh, in again, the nudging um, uh, image, I think, is very um uh, helpful here is that um uh with the nudging image grace is something exterior to us is something that pushes us from outside whereas in the catholic uh, understanding that especially thomas aquinas grace grace is infused in us okay it becomes uh, uh somehow part of our makeup hmm? part of what we are uh, so that, you know, once we are graced, uh, we can become, we can, we can have access to holiness. We can become holy. Mm -hmm. We can become holy. This is why the Catholic tradition celebrates holiness and uh, gives it as an example to the Christians, because he thinks that uh, grace being infused in us, uh, becoming a habit, shapes us in such a way that, you know, we will never be perfectly holy, but we can be can become really, really um, good people, and we can um, again. I'm pushing things a little bit, but that's basically the instinct. We can cooperate with grace. Okay, so human freedom, graced human freedom, can cooperate with grace. The Protestant tradition is is really uh, very very uncomfortable with all this, very uncomfortable with all this, because he thinks that by so doing, we domesticate um, grace. We put grace at our disposal, uh, and it, it thinks that by so doing, by this assertion I told you, grace become a habit, grace is infused, we can start cooperating with grace. Uh, this basically starts to mean that uh, we contradict the two sentences I gave you at the beginning. Without me, there is nothing you can do. Uh, well, you know, once I receive grace, it has been infused and it has become a habit. I still need Jesus, but not a bit less than before. So this is how Protestants understand this um, attitude uh, or this, this instinct of, um, of Catholics. Uh, and for this reason, the Protestant tradition hates the idea of grace being infused or grace becoming a habit. And, and for them, uh, for Luther in particular, this is why I use the forensic image, the image of imputed grace. 
grace is, is you know even uses the image grace is like snow on a heap of of dung okay so we are dung uh, grace covers us so we look white from outside but we're still dung inside he uses that image i mean luther is very very uh, graphic and uh, in his in his in many many of his images and he uh, and this is what is known we can never cooperate with grace never never okay without grace we'll always sin uh, and this is what is known usually as the principle of sola gratia, so only the grace of God. So, you know, as usually it is said, the three principles, uh, recognizable principles, principle of Lutheranism are sola scriptura, uh, only scripture, sola gratia, only grace, and uh, simul justus et peccato. So uh, we are uh, just or justified, uh, but we remain sinners. Okay. Uh, God sees us as just, considers us as just because of Christ, but we remain sinners. So you see how we have really two opposite, two contrasting approaches to uh, the issue of grace. Now, I'm going to finish with this. I'm sorry I had to, to lead you through this. I, I wish I didn't have to talk about this because I find the theology of grace uh, um, frustrating, boring, and absurd, and I, um, uh, I have to teach it, so unfortunately I have to keep repeating these things, even if I find them really, uh, if, I mean, if there is something that can make me lose my faith, are these things, to be, on, to be honest, I mean, especially, you know, the way in which they've been hardened. So the problem with both approaches, both approaches, the Catholic and the Protestant, is that they are abstract and they are polemical. I'm in number 12 in the um, handout. So the starting point is the perceived need to preserve the primacy of grace. So we, we are so worried to, uh, to make sure that grace remains a gift, that salvation is realized by grace, or that human nature is in, integral, etc., uh, that uh, we, um, we end up establishing this very strong um, contrasts, okay? Um, and often, for the sake of the argument, positions harden, become more and more technical. I mean, I spared you the, 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 the kind of taxonomy of, you know, actual grace, sanctifying grace, prevenient grace, uh, gratia gratum fascis, gratia gratis data. They, they were really like, they were splitting uh, airs um, in, in order to try to establish the mechanics of grace and especially in the 16th and 17th century um, uh, it was it was really uh, it had become really wild the the last part of the of the lecture i really want the talk i really want to give you an alternative approach um, to uh, the issue of grace um, which i hope will help us to not to be um, conditioned and and um, um, led astray by these approaches. Now, don't, don't mistake me, theologically I can make sense of them, I can understand why, and I can uh, also um, find positive aspects in them. But I think that when it comes to um, a Christian life, we always, we always have to go back from this kind of excess of abstraction to the narrative approach of scripture of the gospels. If you remember, we did a series of on, on narrative theology. Why? Because this is the way um, scripture, God has chosen. God has decided to reveal himself to us, not through philosophical treatises, even though these are important, but through stories, through stories. And uh, there are two, one story and one poem I want to, I want to quote. The story is uh, the one we, we find, so number 14, at the beginning of the Gospel of John, in which uh, Jesus goes to uh, Nathanael, and uh, verse, verse 47 says, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. He had never met him before, okay? And Nathanael was very surprised and said to him, how do you know me? Uh, you never met me. And Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, under the image of under the fig tree in the Jewish mentality means before you were born. Okay? So, before you were born, 
I knew you. And Nathanael answered, Rabbi, you are the son of God. So for him, um, uh, this assertion and what he feels when Jesus tells him this makes him believe, which echoes Psalm 138, which you know is one of the most beautiful psalms, one of the most beautiful poems of scripture. Number 15, O God, O Lord, you have searched me and known me you know when I sit down, when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar, you search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways, even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. So God knows what we are going to say even before we um, say it. Then verse 13, you formed my inward Part, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. So I let you read the rest of the psalm, uh, even though here is only a part of it, but you can take the whole psalm on your Bibles. It's one of the most beautiful psalms, one which is always good to, um, to go back to. So number 15, one. So there is an aspect of coming to believe in God, which is experienced as being known in a unique way. I feel known in ways that uh, I've never experienced in other possible way. So the idea that coming to believe is an absolute grace is not, as I told you earlier, a psychological description of the process through which it actually happens. Augustine has this beautiful sentence, God is more inward to me than my most inward part. Okay, so I uh, I think that my soul or my my self consciousness is the most inward part. God is even deeper than that in me. So it's a way of saying exactly what the psalm says that God knows me, and even before a word comes on my mouth, God knows it already. Uh, is a way of saying that, you know, it's like when you are very intimate with someone, you start understanding this person even before this person talks. Hmm? Or like with a pet, you know, you start understanding what the pet wants to do even before it starts doing it. Um, I've just got a pet, so I'm, I'm experiencing this at the moment. I'm trying to do this at the moment. So God is like this. From a viewpoint, we might feel, we might feel that it is our desire, our reflection, our education, that lead us to faith, God can move and attract us even without us being aware of it. God doesn't, doesn't need to act against our will or against our intelligence or against our desire. To, God can, can uh, um, influence them from inside even before we are aware of it. Just as the gift of God sustains our being, so it permeates our thinking, desiring, and loving. Of course, at some point, we experience a sudden clarity. We can be overwhelmed by inexplicable joy and peace. We may feel suddenly certain about the existence of God. Uh, there are these moments in the life of faith. Some people experience it in one way, other people in another way. I remember very well. For me, I remember very well the moment. There's a moment. I mean, it's not just, it's like a, a period of one, probably one month in which I went from non-belief to belief. But I remember like just the opening of a of something, a window, which had been closed. I didn't even know that a window was there. And once it was open, I saw the world in a different way. And I had, up to that moment, I was certain that God didn't exist. After that moment, I was certain that God existed. And that certainty has never left me, never. I doubted about the church, I doubted about a lot of other uh, stuff, uh, but never, never, never about God, never about this belief in God. And this is something that happens, and suddenly, at one point. So the sudden aspect is that, is part of what, is, what grace is. And we have to keep these two aspects together. Grace is at play not just when we are aware of it, and grace can and does make itself feel experienced at some point. And this, I think, is illustrated in the most beautiful and in the most clear way in the uh, page of the Gospel, Luke 24, of the disciples of Emmaus, of the disciples of Emmaus. So you remember the story. So the, Jesus is dead. These two disciples 
think everything is finished. They are on this journey away from Jerusalem. Then they see someone walking with them along the way. And it's Jesus, but they do not recognize him. Jesus starts explaining the scriptures to them. And they talk with him, but they still don't recognize him. Okay? And then, uh, at one point, uh, they reach where they want to stop. Jesus wants to, makes as if he wants to go further. And uh, they say uh, to Jesus, please stay with us. He stays with them, still don't recognize him. They are already with Jesus, but they don't recognize him. And then um, they, um, there is the, uh, the breaking of the bread. So the passage is, uh, is the following, um, is in number 16.4. Um, they say, stay with us, for it is towards the evening and the day is not far spent. So when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, uh, and gave it to them, sorry, and, and, and then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. So there is a, an, eye, an opening of the eyes at one point. There is, so there is a, a sudden experience of grace. And he vanished from their sight. It didn't, they didn't need to see him physically anymore because now they were seeing God with their heart. And they said to each other, and this is also very interesting, did not our hearts burn with it within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the uh, scriptures? So go back to 16.1 in your handout. Uh, and these are I think the main uh, things this passage teaches us about grace. The first one is that they did not recognize Jesus immediately, uh, but he was already talking with them. Okay, so this is, this is prevenient grace. So this is what we, say, what we are trying to say when we say that without God, we cannot come to believe. But it doesn't mean that we have to be aware of it. Even before we are aware of it, God is already acting, stimulating our intelligence, our desire, opening up our minds, but we still don't know it. They are not aware that they are being instructed by Jesus when he explains the scriptures to them during the journey. At one point, there is a sudden experience. Their eyes were opened. And only then, after they've come to believe, they realize that grace had been acting in them all along, even before they were aware of it. And they say, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? So only, only afterwards, they can say, they can recognize something they felt before, but they didn't recognize at the moment. And very often, this is the experience of grace. So um, we do not need to know that God is acting in our lives uh, for God to act in our lives. Okay. And it is often only after we have come to believe that we start to recognize, oh, well, you know, this happened. I was led by this way. I start feeling this at that moment. Uh, I was attracted here uh, at that moment. I, uh, providence or, you know, circumstances led me, led me there. And I think it was God who did it. Uh, but only afterwards. So it's, it's, it's a retrospective reading that helps us to see um, this truth that you know, without me you can do nothing, uh, and that everything is a gift. Yeah, but the gift of God does not need to act against our reason, against our desire, against our will. It can already uh, inspire it from the inside uh, before we are aware of it. Um, you know, when I want someone to do something, the only way I have is uh, persuading this person with my words or coercion so forcing physically to do that but i cannot make someone want to do something from inside only us can do only each one of us can do this whereas god when god wants us to do something can make us want to do it because he is the he is at the root of our desire is more uh is more inward to us than ourselves now grace indeed can be experienced, can be felt. And I gave you uh, a passage from Galatians 5, again, one of my favorite passages. The fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy and peace. And often the way in which God leads us is by making us feel a peace uh, or a joy um, or, or, or a delight in something which um, we other people don't find joy and delight in it uh, or peace in it. You know, going to Mass, do you think is you want to go to Mass? Yes, of course it is you want to go to Mass. And yet at the same time, why you do, why you do it is because you find that something, you taste something there that is a joy and a peace that you find there, which other people don't. That's grace. Grace is, is really in the... Um, it doesn't have to be, there are moments in which it is this extraordinary opening of mind, or it is the burning of the heart, or it is this extraordinary joy. But most of the time, grace is what explains why we act in ways other people don't. Why, we, why God matters in our life. Why do we pray? Why do we go to Mass? That's grace. Grace is that which explains why we find pleasure, peace, meaning, uh, joy in things other people don't. I leave you the handout and you'll do the rest of the job. And when we are going to talk about faith, hope and charity, uh, these are the forms of grace. So belief, desire and um, love. We are going to re um, uh, deepen uh, a lot of these principles.